tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Waiting for justice a year after their daughter was killed in Coquitlam. Since she's gone, I, I have no purpose anymore for my life. I'm sorry. A family's agonizing wait. Plus, stretched to the limit. How are we supposed to feed? the clients for the allotment that I get. Home share providers plead for more help as they care for adults with disabilities, but others are leaving the profession. And more news from Nanaimo. CBC British Columbia opens its new bureau in the growing Vancouver Island city. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, I'm Dan Burr. Thanks for joining us. Anita is away tonight. Home share providers in BC who house and support adults with disabilities are crying for help, stretched to their financial limits. As the cost of living continues to climb, they're having to pay out of their own pocket to support their clients. As Joel Ballard reports, it's forcing some to providers to quit the industry altogether. Lisa Garner spends most of the day on the go, supporting her homestay client, cooking, cleaning, helping him get changed and groomed. I am solely responsible for the individual, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Home share providers funding is broken down into two streams, compensation from Community Living BC that varies based on the individual's level of disability support and a room and board contribution of $716 from the client's monthly benefits. According to a ministry document, $375 of that is supposed to cover shelter, leaving $341 to cover the rest, including food. That's about $11 a day. How are we supposed to feed? the clients for the allotment that I get. The individual contribution rate hasn't increased in more than a decade, despite the rising cost of living. Ultimately, Garner says she has to cover the extra costs out of her own pocket, and her experience isn't unique. When inflation started to go up, it's sort of almost the last straw that people we're at the end of their ropes, and now they're finding it just difficult to make ends meet. She says it's pushing many out of the home sharing industry, a difficult decision to make. It's not a job. I mean, it, it's already gone so far past a job that the person becomes part of your, your household, right, your, your family. The BC Home Share Providers Association is calling for an increase to room and board contribution rates, as well as an increase to disability supports. People on PWD do not get enough money. They live in poverty and their caregivers and their families are trying to lift them out of poverty and it's coming out of their pocket. Her pleas echoed by the BC Liberal critic. These, in many cases, are the most vulnerable people that uh, that are being cared for. Uh, we need to make it, we need to be making sure that the people that are caring for these people um, are also cared for. The province declined an interview, but noted that in 2019 and 2020 there were increases to home share providers' compensation rates, and added that room and board costs are being reviewed. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Surrey. Still with health care, changes are coming to how it will be delivered on northern Vancouver Island to try to address unreliable services. The province is temporarily suspending overnight emergency department services in Port Hardy and on Cormorant Island. Well, the ER in Port McNeil will run full time. There will be daily shuttle services for patients and staff. It will run between Port Hardy and Port McNeil, as well as Campbell River and the Comox Valley. Island Health is looking to expand mobile diagnostic services as well, but at least one doctor says this does not address the long-term staffing issue. You know, the picture in terms of medical staff capacity is this is ordering a CT scanner and, and otherwise it's kind of like buying airplanes without hiring pilots, right? You still need, need doctors, you need physician assistants, you need nurse practitioners who are going to be ordering these tests. And, and as it stands, as of July 1st, I may be the only doctor working here in Emerge. Matteris says that there is a physician's assistant ready to start working at his hospital. They just need the green light from the province. A warning, this next story may be distressing. A psychiatrist who treated Constable Nicole Chan the night before her death took the stand at a coroner's inquest today. 
Chan ended her own life after reporting inappropriate relationships with two senior officers with Vancouver Police. More now from the CBC's Yasmin Gandam. Psychiatrist Dr. Kiran Sayapuranju testified that he saw Chan at 11.30 on the evening of January 26, 2019. He released her from Vancouver General Hospital the night before she took her own life. He said he has no recollection of speaking to police about Chan. That evidence contradicts earlier testimony by Vancouver Police Constable Warren Head. Head testified on Thursday that he spoke directly to the doctor who discharged Chan, urging him to admit her. Dr. Sayapuraju told coroner's court that based on information he gathered in his assessment meeting with Chan, she did not meet the criteria for certification for involuntary care. He said she did not show any acute mood symptoms at that point, and she denied having any suicidal intent intentions or plans. She was apprehended by police under the Mental Health Act and taken to VGH. Dr. Sayapuraju said the VPD's apprehension of Chan was traumatic for her because of her history with the force and because she was known to be triggered by police. He said there was a risk that certifying her under the Mental Health Act would only make things worse. Evidence presented throughout the week has painted the picture of a psychologically vulnerable person who suffered from mental illness, made worse by the alleged sexual coercion of two supervising Vancouver police officers. The coroner's inquest is set to wrap up on Tuesday. Yasmin Kantem, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, if you or someone you know needs mental health support or is having thoughts of self-harm, you can get help 24-7 on the number on your screen, 1-800-784-2433. That's 1-800-784-2433. A Maple Ridge family is desperately looking for answers one, exactly one year after their daughter was stabbed to death near her office. Her parents claim police have kept them in the dark. Yasmin Khanea has more on the family's grief and push for justice. Is Ramina favorite tea? Yes, tea. she loved it. Reminders of Ramina Shirazi are everywhere. The 32-year-old was killed one year ago. There is no happiness in our life anymore. Since she's gone, I, I have no purpose anymore for my life. Shirazi was stabbed in a Coquitlam parkade on a Thursday afternoon near the office where she worked as a real estate agent. She later died in hospital. At the time, police said her killing appeared to be an isolated incident. Shirazi left behind three young children. She was such a good girl, a good mother, good, good daughter, full of energy, full of happiness. She, she loved life. Her family says police have given them few answers over the past 12 months. I always contact them. Okay, every week I call them if I have any hint. I call them if somebody says something that might be important for them. I call them. Police say the investigation is active and ongoing, but no one has been charged and no further updates are coming at this time. The Integrated Homicide Investigation Team says our investigators continue to work hard to bring justice for Romina's family and to ensure that those who are responsible for this tragedy are held accountable. Her family hopes justice is served to begin healing. After that, we can have our closure, which we don't have until now. That, that's justice, is that at least we don't want that to happen to anybody else. They're urging anyone who knows anything about her death to contact police. And while Romina is gone, her family continues to celebrate her birthday to keep her fun-loving spirit alive. All the family and friends to make a party for her. Yasmin Ranea, CBC News, Maple Ridge. The B.C. government's request for more information before it decides who will police Surrey has rankled business leaders after an already lengthy process. There's been too much money and time spent. We need to focus on what is needed uh, in terms of innovation, city building, arts and culture uh, types of investments. The absence of a decision yet from Victoria means the state of law enforcement in Surrey will stay the same for now. Mounties and Surrey police officers on the beat. 
It's leading to frustration for people who say that the policing debate is preventing real change from happening. I talked to uh, Surrey Police uh, members and I saw their programs they want to implement in a city. So they are getting delayed, not the police transition or something. The programs they want to bring in the community to stop the overdose, stop the drugs, stop the gangs, they are getting delayed. I'm worried about that. Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth has asked for more information like RCMP officer statistics and the Surrey Police Service's implementation plans. A Courtney City Councilor has now been charged with assault. Court records show David Frisch was charged last week for an offense alleged to have occurred on January 7th. Frisch was released on bail after appearing in court yesterday. The city of Courtney says he is on mandatory leave while under investigation. Frisch has been a councillor for eight years after first being elected in 2014. He's set to appear in court again in mid-February. Vancouver will host men's World Cup games in 2026, and to prepare and pay, the province is going to allow a temporary 2.5% increase in accommodation tax to help with the costs. I know the industry recognizes how beneficial this event will be for them, and so they were willing to go ahead with this because they recognize that funding is going to come right back, pay for the, uh, pay for the event, so it, it, it'll work in the long run. As of February 1st, the City of Vancouver will implement a major events municipal and regional district tax rate of 2.4% that will last up to seven years. This means that overnight visitors to Vancouver will see an extra $2.50 on each $100 spent. The money will help pay for World Cup expenses. Time to check in with meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff for our first glance at the weather as we brace for another big chill. A reference yes. our parents will appreciate. Yes, hopefully the soundtrack to this big chill is as good <laughs> oh, as the Oh, you movies. heard it through the grapevine, huh? Yeah, it's a, it's a great soundtrack. That might be <laughs> our is. weekend watch. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Not a bad idea to pick a movie to bundle up to uh, for the Sunday. That's when temperatures will really drop here. But let me show you the special weather statements in place almost right across the province. We'll see much colder temperatures for the interior, but even down in the south coast, 5 to 10 degrees colder than normal. And note that winter storm warning for the East Kootenays. You're seeing that heavy snow as we speak, waking up to 20 centimeters as that Arctic front pushes southwestward. So taking you through the next 24 hours, there is that uh, slight drizzle risk we're seeing out there. Really patchy, uh, but that will fade through the overnight sunrise at 751. We're getting there. A couple minutes extra daylight a day uh, each day. Uh, waking up to a three, and that is the mildest overnight low you will see in quite some time. Getting back up to a six. It's Saturday night. We'll see temperatures drop. But here is that drizzle that we're watching just for the next couple of hours. By early morning Saturday, things uh, should begin to clear out. There's the sunny afternoon for Saturday, and that sun will come with that Arctic air mass, Dan. So it's cold and clear. I'll take you through how long this thing lasts and how much snow it might bring when it departs coming up in a little bit. Sounds good. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. To other news now, BC's battered forest sector is taking another hit this week, this time on Vancouver Island. Western Forest Products says it will not restart its sawmill in Port Alberni, leaving more than 100 workers without jobs. That facility had been closed since last fall, but it was only supposed to be temporary. Western Forest Products says the mill will not restart in its current configuration. A group, including United Steelworkers and Indigenous Partners, are going to look at other opportunities for the mill. These layoffs follow announcements from Canfor that it was either closing or halting work at three facilities, which could affect as many as 800 jobs. It is an exciting day for us here at CBC British Columbia. Today, we officially launch our new bureau in the Harbour City. Several of our current affairs shows broadcast live from Nanaimo today, including On the Island with host Gregor Craigie and joined by Michelle Elliott, host of BC Today. All of this to introduce our new video journalist and Nanaimo bureau chief, Claire Palmer, who's been busy connecting with people in her community. Claire, welcome. What has your day been like? Well, Dan, it has been overwhelming in the most amazing way. I've had an absolute blast meeting with people today who are sharing in their excitement with this new role with me. Uh, it's been astounding to see the enthusiasm for CBC in this community, and it's been a whirlwind few weeks while I've been getting settled in, in Nanaimo. But why don't we take a look at what the last few days have been like for me?
I'm Claire Palmer. I'm CBC's new video journalist based in Nanaimo. I've just moved from Golden, BC, and I've had a blast getting to know the community. Video producer Mike Zimmer and I spent the last couple days driving around Nanaimo, speaking with locals, learning about the community, and learning all about the history. Good? Yeah, let's go, let's go meet the mayor. So as someone who's new to Nanaimo, uh, what do I need to know about the community here? Uh, you need to know it's proud of its history. It's a beautiful spot. Um, it's a sports town, it's an active community, and mm -hmm. it's a diverse community. We are one of the five fastest growing regions in the country, uh, and that has implications for housing costs. More than half the population of Anchor Island lives north of the Malahat now. And Nanaimo is the gateway, the hub, the center. Anyway, you're gonna love it. I mean, you know, look, yeah, it's what's not to love? So where are we off to next? Uh, we're headed to the Nanaimo Museum just to learn a bit about Nanaimo's interesting history. Hi, nice Hi. to meet you. Hi. I'm Claire, CBC. I'm Sophia, I'm the manager of the Nanaimo Museum. Perfect, I'm really excited to learn a bit about Nanaimo's history. Why don't you show me around? Awesome, well welcome, let's go. So first of all, um, we need to acknowledge that the Nanaimo Museum is situated on the territory of the Sinanamilk First Nation. Mm -hmm. um, we work closely with Sinanamilk First Nation on our exhibits and um, the items and stories that we tell. This exhibit here is one of my favourites and it shows what life was like um, inside a longhouse. Um, this spot here is very significant. Downtown Nanaimo was the site of a very significant village. So bathtub racing is something I've heard a lot about since I've moved to Nanaimo. Yes, Nanaimo is very well known for the famous bathtub races. And the original bathtub races were fun and silly, but over the years it has evolved into a really um, intricate and well-attended sport. So no visit to the Nanaimo Museum would be complete without discussing the world-famous, legendary Nanaimo Bar. Been looking forward to this part. Right. So the Nanaimo Bar is a legend. Um, there are many debates around the appropriate um, custard to base ratio. Um, we actually have here the, um, the ultimate Nanaimo bar recipe. So this recipe was um, submitted by Joyce Hardcastle uh, in Expo 86 to a competition and this was the winning recipe and I have to say it is absolutely delicious. And where's your favorite place to get an Nanaimo bar? My favorite place to get a Nanaimo bar is right next door at Sirius Coffee. It's attached to the museum and they do a mean Nanaimo bar. Now where are we going? Uh, let's head to Departure Beach Bay and talk to some locals. Okay. I'm new to Nanaimo. What would be your top tips for somebody who's new? What advice would you give? Well, the waterfront uh, is beautiful. Nanaimo is um, a great community. We're pretty friendly all in all. Everybody cares for each other. Yeah, people are very friendly here. We love the place. It's been great getting to meet the locals and residents. It's clear this is a really special community to many. I've had a blast exploring the area, and I can't wait to continue to highlight Nanaimo on CBC. Claire Palmer, CBC News, Nanaimo. Was that good? Yeah, it's good. Cool. Awesome. So moving to Nanaimo was a big change for me, but it's been made so much easier by how overwhelmingly kind the community has been. I can't wait to continue to share stories from this island community and maybe enjoy a Nanaimo bar or two along the way. Dan? Very good idea. Claire Palmer, our new Nanaimo Bureau Chief. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Weather forecasting is important when making weekend plans, but what about battle plans? How forecasting helped the Allies prepare for a massive invasion in the Second World War? That story and more after this. And thank you for watching our commercial free live stream tonight. A little later, but here we are. It is a busy time uh, at a massive snow maze south of Winnipeg, recognized as the largest one on the planet by the Guinness Book of World Records in 2019. The CBC's Fiona Audlum recently caught up with the maze's owner-operator. St. Adolf, Manitoba is home to the world's largest snow maze. And this year, it's getting bigger. Angie Moss, this place is 
just exploding with activity right now. Tell me what's going on here at the snow maze at Amazing Corn. Oh yes, it is very busy. Actually, you may not be able to see them at the moment, but there are uh, carvers in pretty much every building. They're creating the snow bar over there. Um, the snow maker is going, the piston bully is pushing snow around to make snow mountains. So there's just so much to create, but unfortunately it takes so long to create it. So now what challenges have you encountered this year with the weather and making the snow maze? Oh yeah, as always, you know, whenever you deal with mother nature, you're at the, the beck and call of the weather. Um, it started out too warm and then it got too cold. And um, uh, of course, with all the snow, everybody thinks that's helpful, but um, we do make all of our own snow with the snow makers over there. Is there an ideal temperature for, for making a snow maze? Well, there's the ideal temperature for the workers who really love this uh, temperature is very nice to be outside as opposed to last year when it was like minus 30 and we were frozen. Um, but the only problem is anything warmer, like for example, this weekend, we probably won't work because it's too warm and then all the tractors sink. So and then it also doesn't make nice snow. It makes it very yellowy and wet, obviously. So from beginning to end, how long does it take? A long time, yes, very different than the corn maze. Um, I would say for sure for the maze part, about a month. Um, but then of course we add all the buildings and the sculptures and um, these people are so creative in terms of what they create. And then of course we keep adding more and more. How big is it gonna be this year? It's always a little bigger, just in case someone's out there to challenge us. So we still hold the record. I think that was back in 2019. This is our fifth snow maze season and um, so we've only gone for the title that one year and I haven't heard of anybody breaking it so we're still the record holders um, but needless to say we always have it in our back pocket that hopefully we're still always the largest. Okay, before I let you go, tell me about this thing hiding behind me. What is that? <laughs> yeah. If you are looking for a new uh, place to live, this last year it was a church, which was so beautiful. And this year it's a little hobbit house. And it's so cute and hence the little rounded door. And you go in, it has all kinds of things in there. I don't want to give it away because you have to come and see it in person. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Angie, I can't wait to get lost in the maze. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's time to highlight the CBC Explore series Planet Wonder, hosted by our own Johanna Wagstaff. The series asks unexpected climate questions and takes you on a journey to find the answers. For instance, there was a time when wars were won and lost because of the weather. The most notable example, the Allied invasion of Normandy during the Second World War. Have a look. Loading begins June 1st, 1944. 3,000 ships are about to cross the English Channel, carrying 2,000 smaller landing craft. The accuracy of weather forecasts is crucial, especially when lives hang in the balance, as they did during World War II. In the spring of 1944, as the Allies prepared for the invasion of Europe, a key component of the decision-making process was the weather, and more importantly, the accuracy of the forecasting of the weather. The invasion was to involve airborne troops landing by parachute or glider at night, bomber aircraft needing visual views of the ground for pinpoint bombing of key targets, and ships to transport troops across the sea and land them on beaches, and the timing of tides to address the beach defenses. All of these components were dependent on the weather and the go, no go decision of the weather forecast. Weather data collection was in its infancy. No satellites, no ocean buoys, no specialized aircraft and no computers as we know them today anyway. They had some ship observations and some land-based observers and historical charts. What they definitely didn't have was agreement. Two camps of meteorologists, the first saying use historical patterns and weather cycles to support current station reporting and go ahead with the invasion June 5th, 1944 as planned. The second arguing it was better to delay, to wait until June 6th when a better window of weather opportunity would open up. The generals 
listen to the second group, and the Normandy landing was delayed until June 6, 1944, when a small high-pressure system opened up after a storm. This event is now known as the most significant weather forecast in history. Years later, during a ride to the Capitol for his inauguration, President-elect John F. Kennedy asked President Eisenhower why the Normandy invasion had succeeded. Eisenhower's fitting response, because we had better meteorologists than the Germans. And Johanna is here with us once again. Joe, not exactly a secret, you're a history buff, also a pilot, scientist, added to the list. There are other instances, though, where weather has helped shape history, right? Yes, and I, I do love looking back at this, Dan. And, and one of the biggest revolutions when it comes to weather forecasting was the introduction of satellites to monitor the weather on Earth from space in the 1960s. And I love this. So in JFK's famous 1961 speech to, speech to Congress, when he's talking about the nation's goals, we all know that first speech, the I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before the decade, of out, decade is out of putting a man on the moon. Most people don't know that two points later, he had four points in his speech. His fourth point was about committing to the Weather Bureau, $53 million to introducing weather satellites to increase our forecast. And indeed, weather forecasting was revolutionized in the 60s. NASA lost, uh, launched dozens of weather satellites that gave us a picture of Earth from above. And this is how much of a nerd I am. I actually have one of the original <laughs> operating manuals. Of uh, course from NASA. you do. Yeah, it's yeah. the review of the, uh, of the satellite space uh, missions between 1960 and 1969. And honestly, Dan, we, other than supercomputers, uh, satellites are basically the greatest tool that we've had since the telegram when it comes to weather forecasting. But I just love that he snuck that in the speech. So when you're <laughs> memorizing the JFK man on moon, note that the fourth mm -hmm. point was actually weather. There you go. It's for all of you school children out there, important to remember the four points. There will be a quiz. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. <laughs> you're welcome. If I do not push for an inquiry, it means accepting the status quo calling out the federal liberals on their commitment to fighting harassment and abuse in sports. And it's from one of their own, why a former minister says the government is dragging its feet after this. Sisters, a gay and lesbian bookstore with a history of conflict, violence, and disappointments, but rarely triumph. Today, though, there is some talk of celebration. And it is a joyous day for us, and we will continue. On the store's crowded steps this afternoon, its manager sang the praises of a B.C. Supreme Court decision that technically ruled against the store. It was a ruling by Mr. Justice Smith on a constitutional challenge the store levied against Canada Customs. Since 1986, hundreds of books and magazines headed for the store have been seized at the border, ruled obscene by customs officials. Each step of the way, the store has cried foul, and many have jumped to its defense. Mainstream stores like Duthie's have ordered and received the same books without any problems. And then came this high-profile constitutional case, enlisting support from authors across the country, including Pierre Burton. It's an outrageous trial. It's a harassment. It's a case of harassment by the government against a small bookstore, which the government doesn't, doesn't like. But after 40 trial days, Justice Smith ruled that Canada Customs officials are within their legal rights to seize the publications. Yet in page after page of his judgment, he talks of systemic deficiencies, saying there were inconsistent decisions on some of the seizures, some that were the result of mere human error, others that are the arbitrary and improper consequence of an inadequate and flawed administration of the legislation. We feel, well, we feel good about that, that to realize that the courts are beginning to deal with our issues in a sensitive way. They may be claiming a moral victory, but this was not a legal win for Little Sisters. So with judgment in hand, they are making preparations to do what they've become accustomed to, launch yet another appeal. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Vancouver.
A former member of Justin Trudeau's cabinet is questioning the government's de dedication to fighting harassment and abuse in sports. She says when she was a minister, before scandals put a spotlight on the issue, the government showed little interest. The CBC's Devin Haru spoke with former sports minister Kirsty Duncan about those claims. Speaking exclusively to CBC News, former sport minister Kirsty Duncan says there was a climate of resistance on sport policy she was introducing both from liberal colleagues and sport officials. And she says she faced pushback when she made tackling abuse a top priority. I will not stand idly by while there are athletes, children and young people hurting in this country. And I do not accept the status quo. And if I do not push for an inquiry, it means accepting the status quo, and I will not be complicit. Duncan introduced a number of safe sport measures as sport minister in 2018 and 2019, including a helpline and a third party investigation unit. She was not reappointed to cabinet by Trudeau after the 2019 election. Duncan says she felt her safe sport initiatives were not given the attention they deserved after she left office. Trudeau dropped the position of sport minister at the time and folded those responsibilities into the heritage minister's portfolio. Stephen Gilbo was a minister at the time. A senior government source acknowledges other priorities required more attention, including how sports organizations should respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. The source also said they totally understand Duncan's claim that more could have been done to move forward on safe sport initiatives. Duncan is frustrated. I don't think people understood the problem. There wasn't a lot of interest in parliament. I asked what we were doing and I was told that we had to stop this safe sport stuff and get back to what sport was really about. My answer was, so not protecting children? Current sport minister Pascal Saint-Ange was asked about Duncan's claim that the government isn't doing enough to protect athletes in the country. I can tell you that we're taking it extremely seriously. Uh, that's why we've invested $16 million in the last budget just to create the Office of the Sport Integrity Commissioner because we felt it was so important to have that independent mechanism. Duncan believes a public inquiry to unearth what she calls sports dirty secrets around physical and sexual abuse is the only way forward now. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. Today is International Holocaust Remembrance Day. The six million victims are being commemorated across Canada. And as Deanna Sumanek Johnson tells us, educators are working to ensure the important lessons of that tragedy are shared with younger generations. In Montreal, many educators, some of them Jewish by background, some not, have taken it upon themselves to share with kids in an age appropriate way what happened in the Holocaust and why they must not forget it. Because it happened and it impacted not just soldiers, it impacted children, families, the elderly, babies. When you bring it down to the human level and you make them realize it could happen to anyone for any reason, and we start to explore that as a human experience instead of simply as, oh, that's only f something that would happen to the Jewish people the children began to make connections and they realized this is a larger global issue. Still, few things can match the power of that first-hand Holocaust survivor testimony, even if there are sadly very few Holocaust survivors left to share that story. At 90 years of age, Pinkhas Guter is never tired to share his story with school children. Pinkhas Guter was just 11 years old when his entire family, including his twin sister, perished at the hands of the Nazis. And he said, despite it all, what happened to him, all the hatred happening in the world today, he is still hopeful, hopeful that he can pass on the message to young people and they can carry it on into the future. Have a listen. I say, I have a torch. And my torch has got more than one flame. It's got many flames, but I'll just give you five of them. And those, that torch has got no religious discrimination, 
no racial discrimination, no homophobia, no xenophobia, and above all, no hatred. Hatred is vicious, it's pernicious, it creates anger. And I'm handing this over to you. These flames, I'm handing it over to you. Carrying that torch of not letting the hate and intolerance of today become the tragedy of tomorrow. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. There is a lot of anger and grief tonight as people process what they're now seeing with their own eyes. A video, now public, shows the confrontation between 29-year-old Tyree Nichols and police on the street in the U.S. from several angles, three days before he died in hospital. We are going to show you some of that video tonight, only short sections to give you an idea of what happened. But we need to stress, it is disturbing to watch. Paul Hunter has more. The video begins with an apparent traffic stop and turns violent immediately. Eventually, Nichols somehow frees himself and flees as police seem to try tasing, then chasing, then giving up. Later, Nichols is surrounded again at a street corner not far from Nichols' home. It's here that a significantly more brutal assault takes place. Five men in police uniforms. CBC News has decided not to publish the worst of it. After kicks, punches, strikes by a baton and a cry for his mother, Nichols is dragged and propped against a vehicle. Eventually, medical help arrives. Nichols died January 10th after the beating he'd survived three days in hospital. This photo was released by his family, underlining the severity of his injuries. Outrage at the brutality inflicted on Nichols came well before the video was shown to the world. It brought swift charges against the five now ex police officers, each now facing multiple criminal charges, including assault, kidnapping, and murder, each facing decades in prison if convicted. I want to say to the five police officers that murdered my son, you also disgraced your own families when you did this. But you know what? I'm going to pray for you and your families. Nichols' mother has all week called for calm in Memphis while demanding justice, still stunned and eviscerated by all of it. You have no clue how I feel right now. No clue. But in the U.S., there are so many who do because so many black men have died after an encounter with police. In this case, notable that the police themselves were black. Race may or may not have played a role in what happened to Nichols, but his death has sparked new calls for police reform in America. Paul Hunter reporting tonight. In the Middle East, a Palestinian gunman has killed at least seven people and wounded another three in an attack out near a synagogue outside Jerusalem. Police say the gunman opened fire, hitting a number of people before security forces killed him. It follows increasing tensions in the region after Israeli forces killed nine Palestinians the day before, including militants and a 61-year-old woman. Palestinian officials say that was the deadliest single incident in the occupied West Bank in two decades. We need a consistent way of measuring time. From Pacific Standard to Mountain to a half hour later in Newfoundland, it can be hard to keep track of Canada's many time zones. But what about the lunar surface? We'll tell you what scientists think. The moon needs a time zone. Why? After the break. We call in the soldiers of the vineyards. As they go through the vineyards, they eat all the small insects, so we don't have to spray for any pests in the vineyards. They keep them pest-free. Um, they are the caretakers.
they don't waddle like normal ducks. They walk. They are, they've got an upright um, posture and their long necks actually help them to eat the snails within the vineyards itself. When it's up there in between the leaves, they can reach that and they can eat them there. It was quite fascinating to see how they follow each other quite sweetly and quite passionately. Um, and I've inquired about the following, um, you know, who takes leadership. And one of the guys indicated that, you know, all of them uh, act as leaders. And if one, you know, kind of missteps, someone else will uh, take over and, you know, take the leadership um, to guide them through wherever they have to go. We're sharing really important information with the public, and I feel like this is exactly what our job is, especially as the public broadcaster, especially in morning radio. That's incredibly important. Land Back is a CBC original podcast where we uncover land theft in Canada and look at how Indigenous people are taking it all back. Land Back is out now on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. Here's another reason to make sure your watch is set. Scientists are working to define time on the moon. There's going to be, uh, over the next uh, couple of decades, we know many, many missions that are going to be going to the lunar, to the lunar orbit and to the lunar surface, we expect. Uh, and we need to be able to coordinate between these and we need to make sure that um, uh, we're not uh, uh, running into problems with you know, not using consistent uh, metrics between each other. Defining lunar time will involve installing at least three master clocks that tick at the moon's natural pace, which is slightly faster than time on Earth because the moon has weaker gravity. The clock's combined output could then be synchronized to Earth time. Much like with the, the trains of old and the train system of old, we need a consistent way of measuring time and of doing business generally uh, that all nations can agree on. Currently, each mission has used its own timescale. It will also allow this new project, the creation of a lunar satellite navigation system similar to GPS on Earth. Our full BC wide weather forecast now with meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. Joe, we're waiting for that Arctic air to hit the mm -hmm. south coast. How much snow? How cold? I ain't too proud to beg. <laughs> you were on fire with those uh, 80s references tonight. Google's a yeah. great resource, really. Yeah, <laughs> didn't have the cassette tape with me. <laughs> or the beta, for that matter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I've got. Uh, yeah, you know what? I can answer both of those questions. I think that's fair. How cold and how long and how much snow? Uh, let me take you through, first of all, the beginning, the entrance of this Arctic air mass that is bringing a shot of snow to places like Prince George, a couple centimeters. Overnight tonight, the 20 centimeters for places like Kimberley. But as that cold air descends, it will bring in the 
the clear. So it's cold and clear to start this weekend. And even as we see those temperatures drop Saturday night, uh, it'll come with sunny skies for Sunday and through Monday. And keep in mind, this isn't an extraordinary cold swing, nothing like what we saw back in December. This is below seasonal, but it's it's making headlines, I think, because of how mild it has been. So it's that dramatic changeover that's exceptional. Uh, taking you through to Monday night, that's when we're going to start to see some weather enter in from the north, some milder air, and that's what will eventually kick out the system at this point. We could see 5 to 10 centimeters for places like Vancouver before switching over to rain on Wednesday. We'll have to keep an eye on that exit strategy. also wanted to show you that this Arctic air mass is not just headed out to Vancouver. It's cross-country wide. Here's early next week as it dives through central Canada. It won't miss the Great Lakes with minus double digits. These are all just afternoon highs, by the way. And by late next week, getting out to Atlantic Canada, uh, again, these are afternoon highs, not counting the overnight lows or the wind chills. So it's everywhere, everywhere, all, not all at once though, but eventually it will get from coast to coast. Six tomorrow and then just a one for Sunday, quite brisk as well with those northerly winds. And if your mm -hmm. uh, house sound or uh, near the strait, you'll see, you'll feel those uh, outflow winds a little stronger, mm -hmm. maybe gusting to 50 kilometers per hour. Notice those minus five temperatures through the morning hours. High cloud sneaks in Monday, overcast Tuesday, and then there's that snow to rain on Wednesday. Mm. So if you have plans, start maybe thinking about leaving a bit more time before we're mm. back to the plus side of zero, Dan, just mm -hmm. in time for late next week. It's not long lived. I second that emotion. Which motion? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're just going to play at the end of the string on that one. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you now. Very good. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. Travel restrictions may have ended last spring in the Northwest Territories, allowing for tourists to return. But many operators say they're seeing less than half the number of visitors they did before the pandemic began. Lou Carroll takes a look at what's behind it. Operators and tourism leaders are attributing the low tourism numbers to the fact that travel in general hasn't returned to pre-pandemic levels. Some say tourism is around 20 to 30 percent of what it was pre-COVID. There have also been other issues including a lack of flights into Yellowknife and constant overcast for the month of January. It's my first season to work here and it's been great for me, but probably it's been a bad for the guests because it's been unusually warm and once it gets warmer, it gets you know, cloudy and it makes the snow, right? Luckily, sunny weather is in the forecast for Yellowknife next week and more flights are going to be arriving as soon as mid-February. But Yellowknife isn't the only community experiencing a lack of visitors. Kyla Kassoon Taylor runs Tundra North Tours in Inuvik. He says it's also experiencing that post COVID travel lull. And it's been made worse by a lack of amenities in Inuvik. I think it's just a matter of uh, things recovering, but also our region recovering. Um, a lot of wholesalers, a lot of um, bigger companies that sell our tours are having a hard time because of the uh, amenities that just aren't available. You know, there's, you bring up some clients, but they've got no place to eat. It's kind of a basic human need. He said the pandemic has made recovery harder and they've had to change their business format, including moving their facilities entirely onto the land. But although there are less visitors, he said there have been some benefits to that. Like you don't wanna create an industry where um, it just consumes you. <laughs> It consumes your region and your resources and your people. You want to you wanna create something that enhances it. Kasun Taylor said he's happy to let visitors experience the Arctic the culturally appropriate way. Luke Carroll, CBC News, Yellowknife. Remembering a legend. A Quebec First Nation is celebrating the life of former Vancouver Canuck Gino Ochik. We're going to take you there after this. People come up and they look at my belts at a show and they say, you have beautiful work. It's a small thing for them to say, but they have no idea how much that feeds my spirit, like how good that makes me feel. So I grew up in the 80s, I was an 80s kid, and heavy metal was all the rage then. I would make leather wristbands with studs on it, and I make them for my buddies, and they like them, they'd buy them. 
So it's funny how that all came back to me once I started doing it again. And I noticed that women like to wear with their ribbon skirts, they like to wear the big belts. My wife had wanted a belt for a long time and I priced them out, they were pretty expensive. But I thought, well, I can do that. <laughs> Through part of my healing is, you know, they said that you need to engage and work with all aspects of your being, and one of those being your creative side. And so I made a belt for her and she loved it. All of a sudden, my nieces and my sisters started asking me, you know, can you make me one? And that grew, they shared it, and it just grew and grew because of social media. I couldn't keep up, I actually, the demand kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But what I came to understand is there's very few makers that make large belts. You know, it's like, hey, those, those relatives want to look beautiful in ceremony too. It wasn't like I was meant to start a business. I think it kind of just started itself in an organic and really cool way. So I started making bath bombs. A group of friends and I went to medicine camp and then we had a night where we all decided, hey, let's come together, do solstice and exchange handmade gifts. So I spent a lot of time researching um, how I could make things out of the medicines that we gathered. And so that was kind of how I taught myself how to make those things. I ended up making them every year for family and friends. And then a couple years ago, I had um, five or six baskets left and I just did a Facebook status that said, hey, is anybody interested in buying these wellness baskets? I made bath bombs that are scented like sage, sweetgrass, soaps, lotions. Those sold, I would say like within five minutes and then I got 30, 40 messages later on that day of people saying, can I get one, can I get one? And then remembering that time that maybe you went sweetgrass picking with your parents or your kookum. Really just having people remember who they are and embracing that and feeling good about that. Hi, I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Stream your favorite CBC dramas or comedies 24-7 on demand on the CBC Gem app. Plus, you can live stream CBC Vancouver News. Check it out at gem.cbc.ca. And never miss a special programming series or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver inbox and keep connected with us. Tributes and stories are still pouring in for Gino Ochik. The former Vancouver Canuck tough guy died earlier this month after a long battle with a rare terminal illness. Olivia Stefanovic takes us to his home community in Quebec, where he's being remembered for who he was on and off the ice. Before he became known as one of the NHL's toughest players, Gino Ojik learned how to never back down here. On the res, sometimes that you have to go through situations where if you want to help yourself out, you got to fight for yourself. And then he wrote on it right here, we're the strongest, we're the best looking, we're Kittigan Zibi. Childhood friend Jan Cote says that determination continues to motivate the next generation. Look at all these kids right here. These are all hockey players that have played after Gino. From the moment he was drafted by the Vancouver Canucks in 1990, Ojik became a formidable force, racking up the franchise's most penalty minutes. But off the ice, Ojik was soft-hearted. He pushed kids about education, and he'd often write on his hockey cards when he was signing, stay in school. A message he shared during a 1995 spiritual journey of healing. Ojik walked from Calgary to Vancouver, insisting on as many stops in First Nations as possible. He didn't want people to have to struggle more than they have to. His sister says her brother never forgot his roots, 
wearing jersey 29 throughout his 12-year career, the number given to their dad at residential school. He didn't want to forget where his dad came from. He didn't want to forget where he came from. He was very kind to me. A role model to Indigenous youth, including his nine-year-old grandson, Sebastian. He made friendships with everyone he knew. A beloved community member and sports icon, sorely missed, whose legacy is larger than the game. Olivia Stefanovich, CBC News, Kitigan Zibi, Anishinaabeg, First Nation. Well done, Tino. We're in tonight with more on the launch of our new CBC News Bureau here in Nanaimo. Today, several of our Radio Current Affairs shows broadcast out of our harbour city. Our videographer, Mike MacArthur, shows us how that day went. Good afternoon and hello from beautiful Nanaimo. We are here, yes! We're here at Serious Coffee on Hammond Bay Road to mark the launch of a new CBC Local Bureau to bring you more local stories. We'll meet our new video journalist based right here in town. We'll be joined by some of the people and the vendors who make this a great place to be. CBC is now here in Nanaimo uh, to be in the community, living in the community, telling the stories of the Mid and North Island. And so we're having these three radio programs here today and tomorrow morning, Saturday morning on North by Northwest, uh, just so that we can meet members of the community, hear what kind of stories they want us to tell, and let them know that CBC is in Nanaimo for good now. Claire will be filing to our radio newscast, to our current affairs programs, uh, but she'll also be, uh, she's a camera with her, so we'll also see than IMO uh, on our video stories and as well on our digital. Bringing the content to all platforms. So on the television program, on the website, on the apps, uh, Claire will be telling the stories of Nanaimo. Well, I'm a video journalist in Nanaimo, which means that I will be covering stories across all platforms, video, radio, web, photo, you name it, I'll be doing it. Locals have been telling me they want me to cover human interest stories and hearing about the culture that Nanaimo has, the art scene and the music scene. Uh, but there's also a lot of issues that need to be covered in Nanaimo, including the perception of public safety, downtown revitalization and the ongoing doctor crisis. Um, what are the issues that you are really looking forward to digging into? Mm, obviously, housing is a huge problem across BC, uh, but Nanaimo is in the unique position of being one of the five fastest growing communities in all of Canada. Uh, it's putting a lot of strain. Our next guest is nodding his head. Yeah, it's, yes. it's putting a lot of strain on the local infrastructure, and that's something that I'm really looking forward to exploring. I think it is important to show that the Vancouver Island is just more than Greater Victoria and just the Lower Island, that all of Vancouver Island is important, both economically, tourism, all sorts of reasons, and to connect community, and that's what I feel CBC does, is connect communities across Canada, and it's great to have more on the island. We're happy to be there. Thanks for being with us on CBC Vancouver News at 6 tonight. You can watch us on CBC Gym, the free app, as well as YouTube, Instagram, and our website, of course, cbc.ca slash bc. Michelle Kasub will have your late local news at 11 o'clock right here after the National, so please tune in before you turn in. Good night. Enjoy your weekend.